Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to introduce the last speaker of today, almost the last, and it's Carl Jacobs. He's a teacher in uh, anatomy in, uh, on this University of Amsterdam. Thank you very much. I hope I can entertain you some more for the coming 30 minutes. Uh, first, I want to thank, thank Mark for inviting me. Um, I've been nervous for over the last few months, I think, for being here. <laughs> um, and the reason why is because I'm, I'm not doing any research. So I don't have an article to present you. I don't have any research done in anatomy to show you in relation to the ultrasound. And Mark gave me the free hand. So do whatever you want. <laughs> so I, I am doing what I want. <laughs> and I will show you what I make of it. First of all, the title is Anatomy Continues. And no, my name, Karel Jacobs. I'm a lecturer of physical therapy at the University of Applied Science next door. And I'm working here as an anatomist in part-time function and especially interested in the musculoskeletal anatomy. I know Mark because when I followed five years ago, the third course for ultrasound here in the AMC, I was a student of his, and I said, the anatomy course could be different. And he said, okay, we make it different. And I became the teacher of the anatomy during the course. So that's how we met. And this lecture will be in three parts. It will be about the anatomy continues. In the first part, I will just talk in a few minutes. I will pass through centuries of history of anatomy. Because I think that's interesting, and I had the free hand, so I said, okay. So the anatomy continues in time. Next, I will talk about the continuity of anatomy, but in structure. So in our, in our body, in our human body, the way we are looking at our human body, the way we are looking at anatomy is wrong. And I will, I will show you. <laughs> And then I will, of course, try to <coughs> make a relation between this anatomy, the functional anatomy, and the ultrasound, because that's where you're all here for. So in a few minutes, I will pass through the centuries. It all starts a long, long time ago with big philosophers, Hippocrates and Aristoteles. Those big names were already the people interested in human anatomy. After that, it is the Roman period started. It was Claudius Galen, look at the time. He was a team doctor of the gladiators. And his work was to keep the gladiators alive <laughs> so they could fight again. It would be a marvelous job, I think. <laughs> um, but it was forbidden to study on human cadavers. So he wasn't able to write down or to draw whatever he saw on his work. So he used a monkey, an ape, a Barbary ape. And this was the first book describing the, the anatomy. And amazingly, it, had, it stood there for 1,300 years. This was the basics of anatomy. Okay. So then, 1,300 years later, we're in the 14th century, and it was Modino di Leucci. And I know there are some Italians here, so I thought a nice Italian anatomist would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a professor of the anatomy in Bologna, and he wrote a book, Anatomia, and for one century he was <coughs> the basic knowledge of anatomy. Of course, 15th century. Now we are going a little bit quicker. It is Leonardo da Vinci. He's, he was amazing. He was not an anatomist. He was a scientist of all levels. And just for his um, sculpture, and for his, um, uh, how do you say? Yeah, for the sculpture and the paintings he wanted to do, he, he wanted to show the people the real anatomy. And just therefore, he started dissecting people. He wasn't busy to understand, trying to understand the function. This was after, this was later on. He became interested in the anatomy. So it was completely illegal what he was doing because he did it in secret. It is, I think he was the founder of anatomy. <laughs> in the 16th century, we have, we have Andreas Vesalius, and everybody knows Vesalius, because it's the Vesalius. 
And he was the founder of modern anatomy. And why? Because he was the one who said, anatomy can only be taught by dissection. So he was the third one doing dissection in public. And he gets special permission from the Pope to dissect criminals because it was really still illegal. He wrote the first book written by him and used uh, paintings from real dissection of human anatomy. And therefore, he was named the father of modern <coughs> anatomy. OK, 17th century. Now it's becoming funny. Because it's in England and in Scotland, the first medical schools arise. They start to become interested, medical doctors. They start, <coughs> there's a new life for them. But there was a big shortage on cadavers. An anatomist relied on executed prisoners. It was for real that when you stole a pig, you were hung. It's a pity. But when you did something worse, you were hung and dissected. It was the biggest punishment of criminals. And I think it still should be. <laughs> In that same period, at medical schools, the students and some professors raided graveyards. So imagine you, are, you have a funeral, and that night you go there, you open it, you take the, it's, not, it's a strange time. Eh? So they were called body snatchers. And even students, they get tuitions at their university if they gave in, they hand in a human corpse. Nowadays, it's not possible anymore, I think. Um, the 17th century is also the time of Frederik Ruijs. And Frederik Ruijs is, I think, the biggest anatomist of the Netherlands. Um, he made over more than 2,000 anatomical preparations. He was so famous that even Tsar Peter the Great came over to the Netherlands and was interested in his uh, anatomy preparates, knowing that to understand humans, you have to understand the anatomy. So he bought a complete collection. <laughs> and is now in, and then he died, yes, exactly. Uh, 18th and 19th century. Uh, major steps were taken. These were, I think, for everything in science, these are the centuries really, really important. Um, dissection was made compulsory for medical students, so it's already becoming better. Formalin and fixative started in this period. This is a, a preparate in the museum in, the, in our hospital at the IMSI, the, the Frolic Museum. It's a collection of uh, Frolic of this time. Um, big Anatomist, of course, Henry Gray with Gray's Anatomy. And there are lots more. I just go through the centuries in a few minutes, I said. I can talk about the history of anatomy for hours, so I just took the big ones. The 20th century. I think it's a funny, uh, funny part of our history. Modern anatomy rises up. X-rays, MRE, CT scans, everything to watch inside the human body without dissection. So this is re really interesting. Late 20s, new techniques like plastination. I'm also head of the plastination lab here at the AMC. So Gunther von Hagens, there's also a big museum in Amsterdam now, uses different techniques of conserving uh, the human bodies. So this is nice. This was a few minutes. Huh? For over thousands of years, human anatomy has been interested for many people and society. All over the world, during centuries, people dissected human cadavers illegally and illegally. And why? Because I think they were all driven by the wish to understand. And I think that in this room, there are several people with the same wish. And I think those people still don't understand, like me. And that's why we continue doing research. That's why we stay interested. That's why we are always looking for different approaches, different hypotheses. But those thousands of years, they've brought us here. Today. So what do we know? All of our knowledge is about the human body is described in literature, and they have used dissection to show and to describe loose body parts, like the bones and the muscles, the tendons, arteries, everything. So everything is dissected, taken apart, and that's what we are learning. So for centuries, they took apart to try a functional system. Hmm. At this moment, we are still teaching our students a descriptive anatomy. So we're taking it apart. All the books we're using, Netter, Sabota, Prometheus, 
They're all nice drawings of bodies who are separated, muscle tendon, bone to bone dimensions. I don't think this is correct. Um, I told you I didn't do research. So what I'm saying here is just my thoughts of anatomy and functional anatomy. And I'm proving this by images that I made. So no one to be. <laughs> OK, 21st century. I told you the anatomy in time, and now I'm going to show you the continuity of anatomy in structure. What is new in the world of anatomy? The fascinating fascia, the role of the connective tissue. This is, in my opinion, the biggest topic at this moment in anatomy. The tensicrity model of Thomas Meyer. It's a different model of looking at how our bodies build up and keeps everything together. Functional anatomy, musculoskeletal ultrasound, of course, that's why we are here. And there's lots more that I don't even know about. Okay, Mole molecular biology, anatomy, everything I know. I don't know about it. So, a little part that I do know about is the connective tissue, so I wanted to continue with this. Connective tissue is one of the four major classes of tissue in our, life, in our human body, next to epithelial nerve and muscle tissue. It maintains the form of our body and provides cohesion and structure support for the tissue. The connective tissue has three main components and the cells, fibers, and the extracellular matrix. This is just from the new book of Stecco, what is amazing. A nice diagram of the connective tissue, the cells, the fibers, and the ground substances. I won't go through this because it is 10 to 5, and you have been here all the day, so I won't go into detail of the extracellular matrix and everything. It just, I just want to show you how it is. What are the functions of the connective tissue? Especially structural support, because our skeletal system is connective tissue. There's just more collagen. It's just a different combination of the, uh, the fibers and the extracellular matrix and the cells. Connective tissue, the ligaments and the tendon and the fascia is connective tissue. Connective tissue envelops all our organs and separates them from the surrounding structures. So it makes it possible that there's movement. <coughs> it's storage of energy, regulation of diffusion of substances, liquefy, and it's formation our scar tissue. Okay, where can we find the fascia? Here you have the skin, the epidermis, the dermis, and the superficial adipose tissue. This, the skin ligaments, is already fascia. The superficial fascia layer is in between, and the deep adipose tissue with also structures, and the deep fascia. So you see there's a connection between the skin and the muscle and the fascia. So there's a connection everywhere. In real, here you have the same. You have the skin, the superficial adipose tissue, the superficial fascia, the deep adipose tissue, and the deep fascia. I just continue. This, everybody has learned images like this. You know, so you have the endomysium. The fascicle is surrounded and wrapped into the pyrimysium, and the muscle is in the epimysium. And here you see as well the same structures. Here, there's an electro image of the muscle fibers, the endomysium, the loose connective tissue, and the pyrimysium. OK. So what does fascia look like? It looks like this. This is one part of the fascia. Here, I lifted the skin. I made an incision. It was really funny, because I, during the, the movies that Mark made in Groningen, they were taking away all the fascia. Oh, look, here there's fascia. We take it away. Surrounding the nerve, we take it away. It's they, this is what we have done for thousands of years. And I think we should stop doing this and try to understand why this fascia is everywhere and what is its role, also in relation to pathology. This um, nerve entrapment, entrapment neuropathy is maybe related to a, a, a sliding problem of this fascia, of this nerve, in his surrounding fascia. This is subcutaneous fascia. So here, this is, was a specimen, a cadaver without any fat. This was the skinniest cadaver I've ever seen. 
But it was really, really easy to use for this. So that's why you don't see any fat here. Um, then I took the skin away a little bit more. So you have the skin, superficial adipose tissue, the deep fascia, and the epimysium. Here I made an incision of this epimysium, lifted it up, and now you see, here see, you see the muscles. These are muscle fibers, the fascicle. And you have the perimysium who, sur who surrounds these muscle fibers. And this is connected directly to the epimysium. And I will come back to you later, because I think this is really interesting for the function of the fascia. In this movie, I just show you how I take away the superficial fascia from the deltoid muscle on the right shoulder of this same woman. It was a woman, cadaver, whatever. And you see how it is connected within all this fascia, who is everywhere, everywhere, everywhere also between the muscle fibers. When you separate muscle fibers, this fascia is everywhere, and we are just taking it away. So there's a different color. <laughs> Here I lifted up the deltoid muscle. So this is not the supracromial bursa, but this is the subdeltoid bursa. We are never talking about it, but I think that's one of our biggest issues in relation to mobility disorders. So. You see the, the connective tissue. And what's really nice to see here, and I don't know if you recognize it, this is the humerus, this is the humerus head, this is the attachment of the tuberculum of the <coughs> deltoid. And all these muscles with the connective tissue goes into the periost, because the periost and the connective tissue is the same structure. It's a continuum of connective tissue. OK. For so far. Everybody still awake? Good. The continuity of our tissue, and I will just give you some examples. The biceps, carpet longum, insert in the suprachenoid uh, tubercle. We know this, this we have learned everywhere. The triceps, infrachenoid, the glasses, semitendinosus, and satoris, they find their insertion in the pest and serenus superficialis. We all know this. Tractus iliotibralis is a just a separate structure, no? In every anatomy book, you just have one structure, and it's called iliotubial tract. OK, I don't think so. I made some dissections of the labrum, of the glenoid, because I was especially interested in all this literature describing the separate structures. And I was like, OK, let's check out if this is true. So this is a, a separated scapula with a subscapular muscle, a chromion, this is infra Spinatus muscle, not subscapular, excuse me. The triceps, the glenoid, the tendon of the biceps, and the labrum. A closer look. I took away the glenoid from the scapula. So I dissected <coughs> otherwise than regularly. So still we have a glenoid, the tendon, and the tendon of the biceps. Then I took away the glenoid. And you see a continuum of a structure that isn't written in any book. So here you have the biceps, carpet lorum tendon, continuing into the labrum. It's one and the same structure. And the triceps on the down part of the labrum. Hmm. So I replaced it on the humerus head. I'm a <laughs> creative person. <laughs> so I just positioned the the labrum back with the tendons on the humerus head, and I was thinking about what does this mean for his function? Because we know that in the books it's written that the biceps gives flexion of the elbow and interflexion of the, of the arm, the triceps is extension, and the B articular part of the triceps is extension of the shoulder. Hmm. Okay. I will come back to that in a sec. It's not only the biceps with the continuum. Here you see the superficial fascia of the, of the leg. So there's no iliotibial tract here. There's only an iliotibial tract. When I put my knife there, and I say, this is the limit, and there's the iliotibial tract. I promise to come back on this picture, and I'm going to do this right now. Here you see the attachment of the gratulus over here, the semitendinosus, and the sartorius. This is the superficial 
um, passant serenus. This is the fascia of the lower leg. There is no attachment here. It's a continuum of this fascia. There's the muscles of our leg, the sartorius, the semitendinosus, and the gratulus is attached in a continuum of the fascia of the lower leg. And as I told you, is that the superficial fascia is connected to the muscles with the pyrimysium. So now, imagine you have a contraction of these muscles. What happens with the leg? There's a contraction, there's a tension on our superficial fascia. And this tension on the superficial fascia gives some contraction also, because there's a tear on the muscle fibers and on the su surrounding pyrimidine. So there's a contraction of these muscles as well. This, guys, is our organ of posture. The reason that we are standing straight and that we can do this is because we have this fascia surrounding our muscles and that there is tension on this fascia. This is keeping up us straight up. OK, second part, the continuity of the structures. Now, the ultrasound, because I, it was the Ultrasound Congress, and Mark said you can do everything, but it has to be about ultrasound. OK, it's a new device. You know more of ultrasound than me, eh? trust me, that's for sure. But I think it's a great manner to take a look under the skin. Um, watching the anatomical structure working together, their relation and their behavior. This is unbelievable, valuable, and we can do this with ultrasound. Um, there really is a continuity in anatomy. First, what can we see in relation to fascia and ultrasound? This is also Stecco, and I will show you later Stecco's book. It's amazing. You have the skin, the superficial adipose tissue, superficial fascia, you see the layers, deep adipose tissue, the deep fascia, and the muscles. Um, doesn't start. This is an ultrasound image of my right shoulder. Thank you, Sander. <laughs> and what I try to show you here is, oh, I shouldn't do that. I remember now. So this is subscapular muscle corrugate processes. And what I try to show you here is that when you look really good, the tendon of the subscapular muscles passes over the sulcus intertubicularis and continues in the tendon of the infraspinitis. There is ju it's just a continuum. It doesn't end anywhere. Of course, there are attachments into the periods of the bones, but there is also a continuum. And this is really interesting. A second thing of fascia, what is, I think, most important, is this possibility to create sliding and gliding. Here you see the supraspinatus muscle below the acromion, and you see that it moves quicker than the deltoidus who is above. So there is a sliding possibility. Here you see the sliding in a cadaver, and you see the external and internal rotation of the glenohumeral joint. Of course, the deltoid is not moving, But imagine this gliding possibility, there's not enough liquid or fluid. And this is the fascia creating this liquid and fluid. It's the extracellular matrix who is making this possible. OK. So again, the rotator cuff as a continuum. And I'm almost done. I'm almost done. It has to be clear. There's no single attachment. Everything is working together. And the real function of the rotator cuff is centralization of the humerus head and nothing else. Failure of one side has big consequences for centralization. So if there is a trauma of the infraspinatus, subscapular, supraspinatus, whatever, it has big consequences. This, most people are saying yes, they recognize this point of view. But I say, for example, try to understand the functional anatomy in relation to the continuum of the, the muscles. Then I say the supraspinatus muscle doesn't give a reduction in a function, like written in the literature. No, it gives caudal translation of the humerus head. And I try to do a schedule like this. Humerus head, glenoid, 
numerous, supraspinatus muscle arising from the fossa, attachment somewhere to the acolomias of the numerous head. Contraction, of course there is a slight abduction possibility, but especially there's a caudal translation of the humerus head. Okay, this also, nice. Biceps caput longum tendon. What do you think about that? The same structures, attachment suprachlenoidal in the labrum in a continuum with the triceps. It goes downwards when there's a contraction of this muscle. There's a caudal translation of the humerus head. So also, for stabilization and centralization of the humerus head. So all our physical therapists who are busy with shoulder problems, impingements, and everything, just try to figure out which one is the weak link for centralization of the humerus head. So it could be the biceps and the triceps as well. The triceps' function is the cranial translation of the humerus head. OK. In conclusion. The information we use for learning the anatomy is outdated, centuries. It's a conclusion. Fascia is everywhere, that's for sure. Open your eyes for new different ways of understanding the human and especially the functional anatomy. Because I think this is the place where the answers are going to be, especially for the musculoskeletal ultrasound, of musculoskeletal pathologies. Ultrasound is the great, great value for understanding the functional anatomy and for taking a look under the skin and take a look at the living human body below the skin. And this is what is my biggest dream. No, I'm not going to tell you my biggest dream. because <laughs> You already think I'm crazy. I am. But this is, I would like to go with some surgeons to take a look under the skin. Hmm. So how do we see the anatomy of the 21st century, like Vesalius? Or do we try to take another opinion? Eh? I think it's time for Donald Duck or something. OK, anatomy trains, Thomas Meyer, really interesting book about the anatomy trains, fascia related dissections. Bite and Sigurdsson and Born to Walk, recently published. And this is, in my opinion, the Bible at this moment of fascia, Carla Stecco. So if there are any questions, 